It's February 6th, 2018. Don McGahn is back in the Oval Office with President Trump and the new White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly. The New York Times has just published a story reporting that back in June of 2017, Trump had directed McGahn to have Robert Mueller fired and that McGahn had threatened to resign rather than carry out the order. The story doesn't look good. Trump says, you need to correct this. You're the White House counsel. Trump wants McGahn to say it never happened, but McGahn knows it did happen. The White House counsel is sticking to his guns. He's not going to lie. The president asks again, is McGahn going to do a correction? McGahn feels that Trump is testing his mettle, seeing how far he can be pushed. And so he answers, no, he's not. This is The Report, episode 12. It will never get out. In the last episode, we saw President Trump's anger at the appointment of special counsel Robert Mueller. He was furious at Jeff Sessions for recusing from the Russian inquiry. He asked McGahn to tell the deputy attorney general that Mueller had to go. And he enlisted Corey Lewandowski to pressure Sessions to limit Mueller's inquiry. In this episode, the president goes even further. As news breaks about that June 2016 Trump Tower meeting with the Russians, Trump works to prevent the full story from coming out. And he ramps up his pressure campaign on Sessions, trying to get the attorney general to limit investigations into Trump and to go after the president's political enemies. And when the press reports about Trump ordering McGahn to get rid of Mueller, the president tries to get McGahn to dispute the story, publicly and, more significantly, by creating a false internal record. Remember that June 9th, 2016 meeting at Trump Tower in New York? It was a huge day in Washington regarding the Russia investigation. Tonight, President Trump's eldest son finds himself at the heart of the matter. In a four-day flurry of emails, Donald Trump Jr. and Goldstone set up a meeting at Trump Tower in New York. That would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia. Don Jr. has fervently denied any connection or collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., was expecting the Russians to supply dirt on Hillary Clinton. If it's what you say, I love it. Here's Shane Harris of The Washington Post. So Donald Trump Jr. receives an email from an associate uh, saying that there are Russians who want to meet with the campaign and makes clear in this email that this is part of the Russian government's efforts to help Donald Trump in the campaign. And they are promising derogatory information about Hillary Clinton. And Donald Trump Jr. famously replies, if it's what you say it is, I love it. So he has some expectation that when these Russians arrive, they're going to be bearing some information that is going to be politically useful for the campaign to use against Clinton. And as it's been described by people in that meeting, the Trump team is sort of baffled as to who these Russians are and what exactly they're trying to get from the campaign or what they're offering. It seems clear that they are not coming with the explosive dirt on Hillary Clinton that they had hoped. And the Russians, particularly this one lawyer, Natalia Viselnitskaya, start steering the conversation towards adoptions and the adoptions of Russian children, which, according to Kushner and Trump Jr., confuses them because they profess not to know what it is that she's talking about. As far as the Trump team is concerned, nothing ever came from that meeting. But then, in January 2017, the Senate Intelligence Committee launches an investigation into Russian election interference. So the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is investigating Russian interference in the election, makes a document request. Uh, And in the course of that request, the the Trump administration discovers that there are these emails from the campaign period between Donald Trump Jr. and his associates setting up this meeting in Trump Tower with these Russian emissaries. In mid-June 2017, the same week that the president first asked Lewandowski to pass a message to Sessions, senior administration officials became aware of emails exchanged during the campaign arranging a meeting between Donald Trump Jr., Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner, and a Russian attorney. 
The Trump campaign had previously received a document request from SSCI that called for the production of various information, including a list and a description of all meetings between any individual affiliated with the Trump campaign and any individual affiliated with the Russian government or Russian business interests. When the president's staff learn about the emails, they're worried. They know it looks bad, really bad. After all, President Trump has been sticking to his line about no contact with Russians and no collusion. There was no collusion with Russia, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. There was no collusion with Russia. But here's the campaign having a meeting with people representing the Russian government, promising dirt on Hillary Clinton. And they know there's no way documents this explosive aren't going to leak eventually. Hope Hicks, who is the president's senior communications staffer and one of the people who've been closest to him during the campaign, she learns that these emails exist. And what happens next is this effort at first to try and inform the president about this because there is this concern among the senior staff in the White House that this is going to look really bad. This could look incriminating. These are emails, after all, from the period of the campaign about the campaign trying to set up a meeting with Russians to get dirt on Hillary Clinton. And initially, the president, who says that he this is the first he's heard of such a meeting, doesn't want to hear about it. He essentially says, don't tell me about it. On or about June 22, 2017, Hicks attended a meeting with the president, Kushner, and Ivanka Trump. Kushner said that he wanted to fill the president in on something that had been discovered in the documents he was to provide to the congressional committees and brought a folder of documents to the meeting and tried to show them to the president. But the president stopped Kushner and said he did not want to know about it, shutting the conversation down. Hicks drops it for the moment. But the following week, she reads the emails for herself. Hicks viewed the emails at Kushner's attorney's office. She recalled being shocked by the emails because they looked really bad. The next day, Hicks spoke privately with the president to mention her concern about the emails, which she understood were soon going to be shared with Congress. Hicks eventually goes and actually looks at the emails, uh, along with some other advisors in the White House, and comes to the conclusion that indeed they are very bad. And there's this sort of series of interactions between Hicks and Trump where she is trying to press him on this and say, you know, essentially, we need to read you in on this. You need to know what this says. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He says, essentially, ignore it. It's not going to leak. Well, Hicks is concerned. She thinks it is going to leak. And Trump's response is, well, it'll only leak if we tell a lot of people about it. So you see the president kind of trying to keep it very close hold and almost ignore it. But Hicks is still worried. That same day, she goes to the president to warn him again about the emails and to propose a media plan to deal with the explosive messages. Later that day, Hicks, Kushner, and Ivanka Trump went together to talk to the president. Kushner told the president the June 9th meeting was not a big deal and was about Russian adoption, but that emails existed setting up the meeting. Hicks warned the president that the emails were really bad and the story would be massive when it broke, but the president insisted that he did not want to talk about it. Hicks also recalled that the president said Kushner's attorneys should give the emails to whomever he needed to give them to, but the president did not think they would be leaked to the press. Hicks and other senior staff, including uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, becoming very concerned that, A, this will get out, and when it does, it will be explosive and clearly create a point of evidence in the whole probe uh, that makes it look like the Trump campaign was, in fact, trying to collude with Russians to get information about Hillary Clinton. Hicks turns out to be right about the emails eventually leaking. So now it's July 2017, and the president and his team are going over to the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany. At this point, they become aware that the New York Times is working on a story about this, and they let the president know that, uh, and essentially saying, we're giving you the heads up. On July 7, 2017, while the president was overseas, Hicks learned that the New York Times was working on a story about the June 9th meeting. The next day, Hicks told the president about the story and he directed her not to comment. Hicks thought the president's reaction was odd because he usually considered not responding to the press to be the ultimate sin. Later that day, the president asked Hicks what the meeting had been about and she said, 
that she had been told the meeting was about Russian adoption. The president responded, then just say that. While the president is flying home from Germany, the story breaks. It's the latest revelation in the story that has consumed much of the Trump presidency so far, Russian meddling in the 2016 election. And this time, it involves the president's son. Then on the flight home, the story publishes, right? And so then it becomes clear that the White House is going to have to say something. Uh, and then this very interesting sort of set of exchanges happens where the president now needs to know more about the meeting. And he says, well, what exactly was it about? And he learns that this issue of adoptions came up. And he says, essentially, we'll just say that. We'll just put out a statement saying it involves adoptions. On the flight home from the G20 on July 8, 2017, Hicks obtained a draft statement about the meeting to be released by Trump Jr. and brought it to the president. The draft statement began with a reference to the information that was offered by the Russians in setting up the meeting. I was asked to have a meeting by an acquaintance I knew from the 2013 Miss Universe pageant with an individual who I was told might have information helpful to the campaign. Hicks again wanted to disclose the entire story, but the president directed that the statement not be issued because it said too much. The president told Hicks to say only that Trump Jr. took a brief meeting and it was about Russian adoption. After she speaks with the president, Hicks sends Trump Jr. a proposed statement to put out in his name that says that at the meeting they discussed adoptions. But Trump Jr. knows that the meeting was about more than adoptions and that the statement is misleading. Trump Jr. responds by text saying that he wants to add the word primarily before discussed, which is important. So this is, the statement's going to read, we primarily discussed a program about the adoption of Russian children. Trump Jr. obviously thinking that if this gets out, the emails get out, it will show the conversation was more than about adoption of Russian children. So he wants to add that qualifier to it. Don Jr. tells Hicks that if they don't have the word primarily in the statement, it'll look like he's lying later when the emails inevitably leak. Hicks agrees to change the statement. The statement from Donald Trump Jr. It was a short introductory meeting. I asked Jared, referring to Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort, to stop by. We primarily discussed a program about adoption of Russian children that was active and popular with American families years ago and has since ended by the Russian government, but it was not a campaign issue at the time and there was no follow up. I was also asked to attend the meeting by an acquaintance, but was not told the name of the person that would be meeting beforehand. So there's no mention of Hillary Clinton. There's no mention of derogatory information. There's also, importantly, no mention of the Trump campaign being told that the meeting was predicated on the, as part of the Russian government's desire to help the Trump campaign. All of that is left out of the statement, but those are all facts that certainly Trump Jr. knows and that Hope Hicks knows because at that point she had read the emails. A short while later, while still on Air Force One, Hicks learned that Priebus knew about the emails, which further convinced her that additional information would leak and the White House should get in front of the story. Hicks urged the president that they should be fully transparent, but he again said no, telling Hicks, you've given a statement. We're done. There's one problem with Trump's plan to say that the meeting was just about adoptions. And that's that anyone familiar with U.S.-Russia relations knows that adoptions is code for the Magnitsky Act. Here's Senator Sheldon Whitehouse questioning Kremlin critic Bill Browder about the connection. A conversation with an American about adoptions is a conversation really about what? About the Magnitsky Act. The, the, the Magnitsky Act was passed. Putin retaliated by banning the adoption of Russian orphans. Nobody was talking about adoption. They were talking about the repeal of sanctions so that Russian torturers and murderers could freely travel and keep their money in America. Adoption is, in effect, code to Russians for talking about lifting sanctions. That's correct. So when Veselnitskaya is saying we want to talk about adoptions, what she's really saying is we want to talk about lifting the Magnitsky Act, which, of course, um, would have been a politically explosive thing if that were known, of course, at the time that Russians were lobbying the potential nominee to try and uh, lift that. And he was doing so possibly in exchange for dirt on Hillary Clinton. So this very kind of limited message that the president is trying to focus on adoptions 
ends up actually exposing what was really at work here, which was a Russian effort to try and essentially get the Trump campaign to agree that if it if Donald Trump won, that he would be amenable to lifting sanctions on Russians. On July 11th, Donald Trump Jr. learns that the New York Times is about to publish the content of his emails, which show the prior statement to be false. He tries to get ahead of the story by posting the messages himself. This information saying this, this is obviously very high level and sensitive information, but it is part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. Donald Trump Jr. responds by saying this, it seems we have some time, and if it's what you say, I love it, especially later in the summer. On July 11, 2017, Trump Jr. posted redacted images of the emails setting up the meeting on Twitter after being told that The Times was about to publish the content of the emails. When the information becomes public, and in part becomes public because Don Jr. actually publishes all of the emails. So there's your answer to, will the emails leak? Don Jr. published them. Today, Donald Trump Jr. released an exchange of emails in which he accepts what's purported to be an offer of help from the Russian government in his father's campaign against Hillary Clinton. Later that day, the media reported that the president had been personally involved in preparing Trump Jr.'s initial statement that claimed that the meeting primarily concerned a program about the adoption of Russian children. Over the next several days, the president's personal counsel repeatedly and inaccurately denied that the president played any role in drafting Trump Jr.'s statement. The White House press secretary eventually concedes that Trump weighed in on the statement, but insists that he didn't dictate it. Uh, he didn't. He certainly didn't dictate, but, you know, he, like I said, he weighed in, offered suggestion like any father would do. Several months later, the president's personal counsel stated in a private communication to the special counsel's office that, quote, the president dictated a short but accurate response to the New York Times article on behalf of his son, Donald Trump Jr., unquote. The president later tells the press that it's irrelevant whether he dictated the statement. Did you dictate the statement about Donald Trump? Uh, let's not talk about Mr. it. You know what that is? But can it's you irrelevant. It's a statement to the New York Times, the phony, failing New York Times. Well, just just, just wait a minute, wait a minute. To clear That's not a statement to a high tribunal of judges. Understood. That's a statement to the phony New York Times. So did you on July 19, 2017, the president had his follow-up meeting with Lewandowski and then met with reporters for the New York Times. In addition to criticizing Sessions in his Times interview, the president addressed the June 9, 2016 meeting and said he didn't know anything about the meeting at the time. The you know, when they call up and they say, by the way, we have information on your opponent. Mm -hmm. I think most politicians, I was just with a lot of people, they said, who wouldn't have taken a meeting like that? Mueller analyzes this all for obstruction of justice, but he says it isn't clear whether there really is an obstructive act here. So when it comes time for Mueller and his team to assess whether this kind of dissembling and message strategy by the White House and this deflection constitutes an obstructive act, they go through and they recount all of the things that the president did to uh, limit the statement, to try and prevent the emails from getting out. Uh, remember, at the time, the Senate Intelligence Committee had given a request for documents. So this question arises, was the president doing something to try and withhold these documents? These emails would clearly be within the ambit of the Senate Intelligence Committee's request from the committee. And what Mueller essentially finds is, while the president was dissembling to the press and not telling the full story publicly, there was no evidence that he did anything to try and stop the emails from being handed over to the Senate Intelligence Committee. And there's no evidence that he tried to stop the emails from being handed over to the Mueller probe. So if we think of what the president is obstructing, it's not so much obstructing an investigation here. It's more that he's obstructing the truth from coming out. And of course, later when asked about this, the president memorably says uh, you know, that essentially it's not a crime to lie to the New York Times. Each of these efforts by the president involved his communications team and was directed at the press. But the evidence does not establish that the president took steps to prevent the emails or other information about the June 9th meeting from being provided to Congress or the special counsel. And Mueller says that because Trump didn't attempt to prevent disclosure to Congress or the special counsel, there probably isn't a nexus to a proceeding either. An intent is a problem, too. 
Clearly, the evidence shows that he was intending to not let the public find out, A, about this meeting that his campaign had with Russians in July of 2016, uh, and B, that he didn't want the emails documenting that information, that meeting, to get out publicly. So his intent there is to obscure this. That is very different from an intent to withhold information from an investigation or to try and obstruct that investigation by lying to investigators or by withholding documents that they clearly had a right to have. So when Mueller is talking about the obstructive act here as it relates to a criminal action, clearly this does not meet the test. Donald Trump was trying to keep the public from finding out this information about the meeting in Trump Tower, but there's no evidence that he did anything to try and stop investigators from, in their course of their official duties, from learning about the meeting. Unlike other episodes of possible obstruction we've looked at thus far, Mueller says on this one, the president's off the hook. There's no obstruction of justice here. Trump may have lied to the American public by dictating a misleading statement, but the president's right. That isn't a crime. While all of this is going on, Trump hasn't forgotten his ongoing campaign to pressure Jeff Sessions to unrecuse and to limit Mueller's investigation. From the summer of 2017 through 2018, Trump keeps trying to get Sessions to take control of Mueller's investigation. And he doesn't just want the attorney general to end the investigation into his own campaign. He wants Sessions to turn around and investigate Hillary Clinton instead. At some point after the May 17, 2017 appointment of the special counsel, Sessions recalled the president called him at home and asked if Sessions would unrecuse himself. According to Sessions, the president asked him to reverse his recusal so that Sessions could direct the Department of Justice to investigate and prosecute Hillary Clinton. And the gist of the conversation was that the president wanted Sessions to unrecuse from all of it, including the special counsel's Russia investigation. Sessions listened but did not respond, and he did not reverse his recusal or order an investigation of Clinton. Here's Mike Schmidt of The New York Times. Trump realizes the importance of who is overseeing the investigation being such a crucial thing to what will happen with the inquiry. He tries different ways to push Sessions to unrecuse. He tries to get Sessions to tamp down on Mueller, to force Mueller to look at other matters, and he's essentially doing all this while holding Sessions' job over his head. Sessions knows that the president is upset with him and wants to get rid of him as attorney general, and Trump is calling Sessions or cornering him in the Oval Office and telling him that he should be prosecuting Hillary Clinton. Trump keeps this up for many months throughout 2017 into 2018 and is really trying to bend Sessions to his will and ultimately fails. But that stuff also becomes an important part of the report. And it shows a continued sustained effort by the president to get the top law enforcement official in the country to help him in what looks like a political way to help him curtail the Russia investigation and go after his enemies. And it's a pretty stark example of the president once again um, breaking at least norms to, you know, use law enforcement as a tool, as a political tool. Trump starts to focus on the question of who might oversee the investigation if he were to push out Sessions' deputy, the man currently overseeing Mueller, Rod Rosenstein. After the deputy attorney general, the next person in line is the associate attorney general, Rachel Brand. And Trump wants to know if she'll be on his side. Here's Rosalind Helderman of The Washington Post. Yeah, so Rachel Brand was the third in command at that time at the Department of Justice. It was Jeff Sessions. Sessions had recused himself. It was then Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, and then it was Rachel Brand. Uh, she was apparently something of a personal friend of Rob Porter. And so Trump starts asking Porter, what do you know about Rachel Brand? What do you think about her? Do you think that she would be on our side? Do you think she would be on our team? It's not just that he's angry at Sessions. It's not that he thinks that Sessions has been an ineffective 
active attorney general. He wants to take control of the Russia investigation. Certainly, that's how Rob Porter interpreted it at the time. That's what he later tells Mueller's investigators, that he understood that the reason why Trump was asking about Rachel Brand is he was trying to find out if he could decapitate uh, Sessions and Rosenstein put in Brand as attorney general, and if she would be the kind of attorney general he wanted, who would then be not recused and in charge of the Russia investigation. And uh, Porter's response to this, uh, as we see again and again, is not to tell the president this is inappropriate, uh, but just not to do it. Undeterred, Trump keeps fuming over Sessions' recusal and wondering how to get someone else to oversee the investigation. McGahn recalled that during the summer of 2017, he and the president discussed the fact that if Sessions were no longer in his position, the special counsel would report directly to a non-recused attorney general. McGahn told the president that things might not change much under a new attorney general. McGahn also recalled that in or around July 2017, the president frequently brought up his displeasure with Sessions. And Trump keeps working on Sessions himself as well. Again, he pushes Sessions to unrecuse and to direct an investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. On October 16, 2017, the president met privately with Sessions and said that the Department of Justice was not investigating individuals and events that the president thought the department should be investigating. According to contemporaneous notes taken by Porter, who was at the meeting, the president mentioned Clinton's emails and said, Don't have to tell us, just take a look. Sessions did not offer any assurances or promises to the president that the Department of Justice would comply with that request. Two days later, on October 18, 2017, the president tweeted, Wow! FBI confirms report that James Comey drafted letter exonerating crooked Hillary Clinton long before investigation was complete. Many people not interviewed, including Clinton herself. Comey stated under oath that he didn't do this. Obviously a fix? Where is justice dept? On October 29, 2017, the president tweeted that there was anger and unity over a lack of investigation of Clinton and the Comey fix and concluded, do something. Here was the president saying that someone that the Justice Department has declined to prosecute in Hillary Clinton should be prosecuted. And essentially that the facts in that case do not matter, that she should be put behind bars because she's just a bad person. It's using law enforcement as a tool for your political benefit or your survival. It's different because it's proactive. Obstruction is a defensive move. I'm trying to protect myself from an investigation. I'm trying to protect myself from getting into more trouble or the folks around me. This is proactive. This is going on the attack with the power of government. That is certainly something that amongst both parties had become unacceptable in the post-Watergate era. In late 2017, after Michael Flynn pleads guilty to charges of lying to federal investigators, Trump meets again with Sessions. Tonight, the ongoing Russia investigation has reached President Trump's innermost circle. Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, says that he is cooperating with the special counsel's probe into possible cooperation between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. On December 6, 2017, five days after Flynn pleaded guilty to lying about his contacts with the Russian government, the president asked to speak with Sessions in the Oval Office at the end of a cabinet meeting. During that Oval Office meeting, which Porter attended, the president again suggested that Sessions could unrecuse, which Porter linked to taking back supervision of the Russia investigation and directing an investigation of Hillary Clinton. According to contemporaneous notes taken by Porter, the president said, I don't know if you could unrecuse yourself. You'd be a hero, not telling you to do anything. Dershowitz says POTUS can get involved, can order AG to investigate. I don't want to get involved. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to do anything or direct you to do anything. I just want to be treated fairly. According to Porter's notes, Sessions responded, We are taking steps. Whole new leadership team, professionals, will operate according to the law. 
Sessions also said, I never saw anything that was improper, which Porter thought was noteworthy because it did not fit with the previous discussion about Clinton. Porter understood Sessions to be reassuring the president that he was on the president's team. Here's Matt Zapatowski of The Washington Post. There are a couple of personal conversations between Trump and Sessions. It's not just, hey, can we, can you unrecuse? In one conversation, he mentions Sessions unrecusing and said, you'd be a hero. You know, he thinks like to the Republican base, Sessions would be a hero. But in, in this instance, too, it's not just that. He wants Sessions to kind of violate a separate recusal. So Sessions had said at his confirmation hearing, so this should have been of no surprise to the president, that he would be recused from any Clinton email business. Um, The president now is asking him to investigate his political opponents. Um, And Sessions ended up giving a non-committal response, but not agreeing to do that. And that seems to be Sessions' kind of tack here. In one conversation, Trump is ranting about his various political opponents and how they're not being investigated in the FBI. And Sessions kind of vaguely, vaguely assures him, we've got, new, we've got new leadership in place. We've got new leadership in place. But he doesn't commit to investigating political opponents. At the end of December, the president told the New York Times it was too bad that Sessions had recused himself from the Russia investigation. Trump declined to talk about Sessions but said, quote, Holder protected President Obama, totally protected him. When you look at the IRS scandal, when you look at the guns for whatever, when you look at all the tremendous real problems they had, not made up problems like Russian collusion, when you look at the things that they did, Holder protected the president, and I have great respect for that. I'll be honest, I have great respect for that. Did that strike you as odd, Mike? Later in January, the president brought up the idea of replacing Sessions and told Porter that he wanted to clean house at the Department of Justice. In a meeting in the White House residence that Porter attended on January 27, 2018, the president said that one of his biggest failings as president was that he had not surrounded himself with good attorneys, citing Sessions as an example. The president raised Sessions' recusal and brought up and criticized the special counsel's investigation. The Justice Department has two functions. One is kind of implementing some of the broad policy goals of the Justice Department. It wouldn't be wrong or inappropriate for President Trump to institute his policy agenda at the Justice Department. The other is kind of this independent law enforcement function, investigating and prosecuting crimes. And it is very unusual for the president to even sort of comment on that kind of work, let alone to specifically order them to do things or ask them to do things. So all of this asking Sessions to investigate his political opponents, pressuring him to unrecuse, threatening to fire him, it creates this toxic and, as far as I know, kind of unparalleled relationship between the president and the Justice Department. Over the next several months, the president continued to criticize Session in tweets and media interviews and on several occasions appeared to publicly encourage him to take action in the Russia investigation despite his recusal. In a new fiery tweet, Mr. Trump is lashing out yet again, this time sarcastically quoting Session's statement from Thursday, which said the Justice Department, quote, will not be improperly influenced by political considerations. Mr. Trump adding to that this morning, Jeff, this is great. What everyone wants. So look into all of the corruption on the other side, adding in a second tweet, come on, Jeff, you can do it. The country is waiting. But Sessions seems to be making it clear he won't be bullied. It's relentless. Um, it, covering the Justice Department, at times it felt like it was daily, and at times it felt like it was so much you would lose sight of just how remarkable it was. Um, just every day, some new tweet. Sometimes it's about you know his political opponents and why um, why Sessions isn't investigating them. In some ways, too, I think. It lessened the sort of public impact when some of these episodes, these behind the scenes episodes were revealed, because that's pretty remarkable, right? The attorney general getting pressured by the president privately to investigate his political opponents. But because Trump also did that publicly, it was like, well, we kind of already knew he wanted that. It'd be no surprise that he would say privately to Sessions what he said publicly, because he did so 
just relentlessly. I mean, we we did reporting on how he, he wanted to fire Sessions pretty much from the moment of recusal, was talked out of it, had the resignation letter. But even up into kind of the midterm election, then he would fire him right after the midterms. He's talked out of it because, hey, look, you might cost us seats in the midterm election, us meaning the Republican Party. So he's talked out of it. But then a couple of days after the midterm, he ends up pulling the trigger. On November 7th, 2018, the day after the midterm elections, the president replaced Sessions with Sessions' chief of staff as acting attorney general. News that Jeff Sessions, the U.S. attorney general, is stepping down, apparently at the request of President Trump, issuing a letter of resignation, a move not unanticipated. Sessions' removal is a really interesting day. It's one of those things that it is long expected. Um, yet it still kind of shocks you when it finally happens. I think more shocking just than his removal is that he is replaced on an acting basis with his own chief of staff, a guy named Matt Whitaker. Matt Whitaker very famously, before he came into the Justice Department, but held these views when he was Sessions' chief of staff, was critical of Mueller. He was kind of a cable news commentator and had said things publicly that were very critical of Mueller. Here's Whitaker appearing on CNN before he became Sessions' chief of staff. There is no criminal case to be made on an obstruction of justice. You know, the only difference between this inv current investigation and Watergate is Watergate actually had evidence of real crimes being committed. This uh, innuendo of an investigation of a sitting president, I think, is very dangerous for our republic. And we need to know whether there is actually an investigation or not. I think the American people would like to know that. But Whitaker doesn't last long. He ends up serving a short amount of time. Ultimately, Trump gets Bill Barr, who has a much lengthier record of service in the Justice Department, um, to take over. It obviously turns out to be a very important moment in his presidency because by getting Bill Barr eventually in there a couple of months later, Barr is certainly very important to sort of sculpting the end in the way that the Mueller report was perceived. So how about this? Is this obstruction of justice? To determine if the president's efforts to have the attorney general unrecuse could qualify as an obstructive act, it would be necessary to assess evidence on whether those actions would naturally impede the Russia investigation. The inquiry would not turn on what attorney general Sessions would actually do if unrecused, but on whether the efforts to reverse his recusal would naturally have had the effect of impeding the Russia investigation. The duration of the president's efforts, which spanned from March 2017 to August 2018, and the fact that the president repeatedly criticized Sessions in public and in private for failing to tell the president that he would have to recuse, is relevant to assessing whether the president's efforts to have Sessions unrecused could qualify as obstructive acts. Trump was incredibly transparent about his efforts to influence the investigation, and he did not hide them. If you're trying to substantiate something that's happened in private, like his efforts to get rid of Mueller or Sessions or curtail the depth and breadth of the Russia investigation, there's a tweet for that. There is his own statements that show that this was an issue on his mind. It's sort of giving investigators a roadmap how and where they should look. It's just a way for them to get a greater insight into what the president's thinking and then use his own words against him to prove these different incidents. And the tweets got him, at least in the sense of making the argument about his obstruction and really helped Mueller paint the picture that he wanted. Once again, nexus is easy, but what about intent? There is evidence that at least one purpose of the president's conduct towards Sessions was to have Sessions assume control over the Russia investigation and supervise it in a way that would restrict its scope. In the wake of the disclosures of emails about the June 9th meeting, it was evident that the investigation into the campaign now included the president's son, son-in-law, and former campaign manager. In December 2017, the president told Sessions that he would be a hero if he unrecused. The president said in that meeting that he just wanted to be treated fairly, 
which could reflect his perception that it was unfair that he was being investigated while Hillary Clinton was not. But a principal effect of that act would be to restore supervision of the Russia investigation to the attorney general. A reasonable inference from those statements and the president's actions is that the president believed that an unrecused attorney general would play a protective role and could shield the president from the ongoing Russia investigation. This brings us to one of the most significant events in the Mueller report for the purposes of obstruction of justice. Remember from the last episode when Trump directed Don McGahn to tell Rosenstein to fire Mueller? Well, when that story breaks, Trump tries to get McGahn to deny it ever happened. Here's former U.S. attorney Preet Bharara. At the beginning of 2018, there's a New York Times article that basically sets forth that interaction. And it's kind of a blockbuster uh, story, and the president calls it fake news. And both of these incidents are laid out at some length in the Mueller report. On January 25, 2018, the New York Times reported that in June 2017, the president had ordered McGahn to have the Department of Justice fire the special counsel. We begin with President Trump reportedly ordering the special counsel Robert Mueller be fired, the White House counsel refusing to do this last June. The president tonight denying the claim, but the New York Times breaking this story and outlets from the Washington Post to Fox News to our team confirming the president did want Mueller out. Trump denies it, saying it's more fake news. Fake news, folks, fake news. What's your message today? Typical New York Times fake stories. Mr. Trump. What the White House will say now is, you know, McGahn is still, uh, excuse me, Mueller is still there, so clearly nothing happened. But what we have learned is that last June, uh, the president uh, relayed to advisors that he wanted uh, Mueller fired. The next day, the Washington Post reported on the same event, but added that McGahn had not told the president directly that he intended to resign rather than carry out the directive to have the special counsel terminated. Trump wants McGahn to deny the story publicly. On January 26, 2018, the president's personal counsel called McGahn's attorney and said that the president wanted McGahn to put out a statement denying that he had been asked to fire the special counsel and that he had threatened to quit in protest. McGahn's attorney informed the president's personal counsel that the Times story was accurate in reporting that the president wanted the special counsel removed. Accordingly, McGahn's attorney said although the article was inaccurate in some other respects, McGahn could not comply with the president's request to dispute the story. Then Chief of Staff Reince Priebus goes on Meet the Press to dispute the account. Of all the things that we went through in the West Wing, I never felt that the president was going to fire the the special counsel. So I never felt... It's possible the president uttered the words, I want Mueller fired. I want Mueller gone. I never heard that. But you never took it... No, I never heard that. You never heard those specifics. I never heard that. The next day, on February 5th, 2018, the president complained about the Times article to Porter. The president told Porter that the article was bullshit and that he had not sought to terminate the special counsel. The president said that McGahn leaked to the media to make himself look good. And then the president tells Porter to get McGahn to write a letter saying Trump hadn't directed him to fire Mueller, not for the media, but, quote, for our records. Here's Halderman again. The president kind of escalates because what he tells Rob Porter he wants is he wants Don McGahn to write a letter to file, to write a letter for White House records uh, that would say, uh, this is not true. I was never ordered to fire uh, Bob Mueller. Um, And uh, Mueller's team finds that one especially significant because, of course, once it's in the documentary record, it's not just making a statement to the public. and, And it doesn't really seem like it's intended to shape public opinion, but it's intended to shape uh, the, the, the archives of the White House for, uh, for posterity and also potentially the records that are turned over to the Mueller investigation. And so as they're getting documents from the White House, they're going to get this letter from Don McGahn that says, look, it's not true that I was ever ordered to fire uh, Mueller. Um, and the president actually tells Porter uh, that if Don McGahn refuses to write this letter, uh, the president might just have to fire him. 
Preet Bharara agrees that Trump's request for a written record is especially significant. Donald Trump in some way, in some place in his brain, understands the value of having something in writing um, that is much more difficult to recant. You know, you got a guy who says things that incriminate you uh, to the special counsel, and then you got that same guy writing a document that disavows all those things, you can wave that thing around to the special counsel and to the public and to anyone else for all time so that you can forever cross-examine the person who later recants. And McGahn, to his credit, wouldn't do so. Porter takes the president's message to McGahn. He says the president wants a letter from McGahn stating that he'd never been ordered to terminate Mueller. And if he doesn't do it, the president might fire him. McGahn told Porter that the president had been insistent on firing the special counsel and that McGahn had planned to resign rather than carry out the order, although he had not personally told the president he intended to quit. Porter told McGahn that the president suggested that McGahn would be fired if he did not write the letter. McGahn said that he would not write the letter the president had requested. Here's Mike Schmidt. So in January of 2018, we reported that... Mueller had learned about this effort in the previous June by Trump to have McGahn fire the special counsel. And that was a dramatic example of the president really going to extreme lengths. And in the aftermath of that story, Trump wants McGahn to knock it down. He wants McGahn to say that it's not true. And McGahn is refusing to do that. And Trump is sending different messages to McGahn through other White House aides about how he may get rid of him if he doesn't do this. The next day, February 6th, 2018, the new White House chief of staff, John Kelly, arranges for McGahn to meet with him and the president to talk about the Times article. That morning, the president's personal lawyer calls McGahn's attorney. He says no matter what happens in the meeting with Trump, McGahn cannot resign. At this point, uh, uh, John Kelly, the chief of staff, summons Don McGahn to a meeting in the Oval Office with the president. Trump says, "Um, I need you to take this back. I need you to issue a statement. And again, McGahn says, I'm not going to do that. The thrust of the story was accurate. Uh, You told me to call Rod Rosenstein and say that Mueller had unacceptable conflicts and he needed to go. And Trump kind of seems in some ways to split hairs. He starts saying, did I use the word fire? Did I, did I say fire? And McGahn says, maybe you didn't use the word fire, but you know, you were pretty unambiguous about what it was that you wanted. And so they have a little bit of a back and forth on this. Um, you know, will you put out this statement? McGahn says no. And then really interestingly, and I think importantly, sort of to understand Trump's motivations and, you know, his intent, um, he starts complaining that uh, that McGahn has told this already to the special counsel's office. Trump's efforts to get McGahn to create a false record for internal purposes is one of the most significant events of Volume 2 when it comes to the question of whether the president obstructed justice. To me, always was one of the better examples of obstruction because here you had a president trying to influence a witness. Folks will argue that the president had the right to fire the FBI director. He even may have had the right to end an investigation that he thought could be damaging to the country, right? And those are sort of within what I would call his Article II lane. But the president does not have the power to turn to a witness in an investigation of himself and ask that witness to create a fake document that refutes what the person has told investigators. And it's what I call being outside the Article II lane. You're getting into areas that the president did not have the authority to do. It's not braided together with his powers to hire and fire. It's witness tampering. It's outside the lane. And some will argue, well... McGahn never went back and refuted the story and he never went back and told Mueller that he had been wrong. But if you're just basing it on the intent to influence what a witness had told investigators, it seems pretty clear to me. 
What does Mueller say about all this? Is it obstruction? First, there's an obstructive act. The president's repeated efforts to get McGahn to create a record denying that the president had directed him to remove the special counsel would qualify as an obstructive act if it had the natural tendency to constrain McGahn from testifying truthfully or to undermine his credibility as a potential witness if he testified consistently with his memory rather than with what the records said. What is the president trying to do in getting McGahn to create a record denying the story? On one hand, Mueller says that Trump might have truly believed the media reports were wrong. There is some evidence that the president believed the stories were wrong and that he had never told McGahn to have Rosenstein remove the special counsel. The president correctly understood that McGahn had not told the president directly that he planned to resign. In addition, the president told Priebus and Porter that he had not sought to terminate the special counsel. And in the Oval Office meeting with McGahn, the president said, I never said to fire Mueller. I never said fire. The evidence could indicate that the president was not attempting to persuade McGahn to change his story, but was instead offering his own but different recollection of the substance of his June 2017 conversations with McGahn and McGahn's reaction to them. But Mueller says there's a lot of evidence pointing in the opposite direction. First, it's pretty clear that McGahn is the one telling the truth about what happened when Trump told him to have Mueller fired. Substantial evidence supports McGahn's account that the president had directed him to have the special counsel removed, including the timing and context of the president's directive, the manner in which McGahn reacted, and the fact that the president had been told the conflicts were insubstantial, were being considered by the Department of Justice and should be raised with the president's personal counsel rather than brought to McGahn. In addition, the president's subsequent denials that he had told McGahn to have the special counsel removed were carefully worded. When the president spoke with McGahn in the Oval Office, he focused on whether he had used the word fire, saying, I never said to fire Mueller. I never said fire. And did I say the word fire? The president's assertion in the Oval Office meeting that he had never directed McGahn to have the special counsel removed thus runs counter to the evidence. In some ways, if, if the, the president's version of things were true, it's the easiest thing in the world for someone like Don McGahn, who wants to remain in, you know, gainfully employed uh, and not unceremoniously fired, like some people have been, uh, to just you know, do what the president wanted and say that those conversations never happened. The fact that he stuck to his guns and was prepared to resign rather than take what he said back or rather than correct something that he didn't think needed correcting, that is an argument you take to a jury. You say, look at what Don McGahn did when he was asked to correct something. You know, what do you think is more likely? That, that Don McGahn was lying later um, to make himself look good or that the first time was the truth? You know, what the New York Times was reporting was the truth. All of those things you string together on the issue of intent can make a powerful argument. And there's more. Even if the president sincerely disagreed with McGahn's memory of the June 17, 2017 events, the evidence indicates that the president knew by the time of the Oval Office meeting that McGahn's account differed and that McGahn was firm in his views. The evidence indicates that by the time of the Oval Office meeting, the president was aware that McGahn did not think the story was false and did not want to issue a statement or create a written record denying facts that McGahn believed were true. The president nevertheless persisted and asked McGahn to repudiate facts that McGahn had repeatedly said were accurate. When it comes to Nexus, Trump knows there's an investigation going on, and he knows that McGahn has personal knowledge about a lot of it and that he'd been interviewed by the special counsel. Because McGahn had spoken to special counsel investigators before January 2018, the president could not have been seeking to influence his prior statements in those interviews. But because McGahn had repeatedly spoken to investigators and the obstruction inquiry was not complete, it was foreseeable that he would be interviewed again on obstruction-related topics. Mueller says that if Trump had just been focused on refuting a bad press story, there wouldn't be a nexus. But that's not what happened here. The president's efforts to have McGahn write a letter for our records approximately 10 days after the stories had come out, 
well past the time to issue a correction for a news story, indicates the president was not solely focused on a press strategy, but instead likely contemplated the ongoing investigation and any proceedings arising from it. So there's evidence of an obstructive act and evidence of nexus. What about intent? Substantial evidence indicates that in repeatedly urging McGahn to dispute that he was ordered to have the special counsel terminated, the president acted for the purpose of influencing McGahn's account in order to deflect or prevent further scrutiny of the president's conduct toward the investigation. Several facts support that conclusion. The president made repeated attempts to get McGahn to change his story. By the time of the last attempt, the evidence suggests that the president had been told on multiple occasions that McGahn believed the president had ordered him to have the special counsel terminated. McGahn interpreted this encounter with the president in the Oval Office as an attempt to test his mettle and see how committed he was to his memory of what had occurred. The president had already laid the groundwork for pressing McGahn to alter his account by telling Porter that it might be necessary to fire McGahn if he did not deny the story. Additional evidence of the president's intent may be gleaned from the fact that his counsel was sufficiently alarmed by the prospect of the president's meeting with McGahn that he called McGahn's counsel and said McGahn could not resign no matter what happened. The president's counsel was well aware of McGahn's resolve not to issue what he believed to be a false account of events despite the president's request. Finally, the president brought up the special counsel's investigation in his meeting with McGahn and criticized him for telling the office about the June 17, 2017 events. The president's statements reflect his understanding and his displeasure that those events would be part of an obstruction of justice inquiry. When prosecutors are trying to put forth a persuasive view of their evidence, different incidents overlap with each other and also reinforce each other. And they make the overall case stronger because you have two things rather than one. You don't just have uh, credible evidence and witnesses saying that the president tried to get McGahn to get rid of uh, Bob Mueller. You also have a later confrontation over whether or not that happened in the first place. And what makes the first incident more credible, Don McGahn said these things under oath. The president didn't. When one party testifies under oath under penalty of perjury to a fact and another party doesn't, you can draw an inference that you must uh, you know, find more credibility on the part of the person who testified under oath. Mueller's analysis suggests that Trump's order to McGahn to deny that the president attempted to fire Mueller meets the mark for all three elements of obstruction. But as always, the special counsel doesn't go any further. On the other hand, Mueller finds that the statement Trump dictated denying the Trump Tower meeting didn't seem to qualify as obstruction at all. And his crusade against Sessions, that falls somewhere in between. We're coming close to the end of Mueller's story. He's laid out what the president did in his efforts to hide what happened during and after the 2016 election. Trump tried to get the FBI director on his side. He told Comey to let Flynn go, and when that didn't work, fired him. Trump pressured Sessions not to recuse, then to unrecuse, and to limit the scope of Mueller's investigation. And when that didn't work, he fired Sessions too. He tried to get Mueller disqualified for frivolous conflicts and even ordered that he be terminated, but McGahn and others wouldn't go along with it. And when the president tried to get McGahn to deny a true story and create a false record, the White House counsel refused to do that, too. But there's one last area that Mueller looks at for obstruction of justice. The president wasn't able to get rid of Mueller or limit his investigation, but he does have another hand to play. Mueller needs witnesses to cooperate, He needs the people who were there to tell him what happened. Three of Trump's former colleagues find themselves in hot water. His lawyer, his campaign manager, and his national security advisor. And as they're trying to decide whether to cooperate with investigators, Trump suggests that he might have a way to help them, something that might just help the president, too. I think the whole Manafort trial is very sad. When you look at what's going on there, I think it's a very sad day for our country. 
He worked for me for a very short period of time. But you know what? He happens to be a very good person. And I think it's very sad what they've done to Paul Manafort. That's next time on The Report. Thank you for listening to episode 12 of The Report. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the Democracy Fund, and by listeners like you. To support this project, please go to lawfareblog.com. The Report is a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo in Washington, D.C. Ian Enright is the executive producer. Production assistance from Shar Dreyer. From the Lawfare team, the project is led by executive editor Susan Hennessy. Editor-in-chief is Benjamin Wittes. Interviews conducted by managing editor Quinta Jurassic. Recordings by Michaela Fogel and Jacob Schultz. Additional assistance by Margaret Taylor and Gordon All. Special thanks to Shane Harris, Mike Schmidt, Matt Zapatowski, Preet Bharara, Rosalind Helderman, and you, the listening audience. To support this show, please share this podcast wherever you can. And while you're at it, please subscribe and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Our website, lawfareblog.com, is where you can learn more about lawfare, read our work, and support our mission. Until next time. You're listening to Goat Rodeo. Keep an ear out for us.